Hello, everyone. Welcome to the part six, uh, the last part of the International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium, as known as ICU Link. I'm Sung Hun Lee from ICU. This event is co organized with uh, Tomoyuki Yoshida and Yoko Mizuta uh, at ICU. Today, we have two exciting talks by Elizabeth Sieger uh, from Georgetown University and Christopher Green from Syracuse University. Let me uh, introduce the first speaker. Uh, Elizabeth, Professor Elizabeth Sieger uh, is a professor of linguistics at Georgetown. Uh, she received her PhD from Yale in 1993. She has a wide range of research interests that include phonological theory, tone, second language phonology, phonetics, uh, and the phonology phonetics interface. She has worked on uh, Setswana, Serbian, uh, and some dialects, as well as Thai and Igbo. Uh, Personally, her work on Thai tone with Bruce Moran uh, was probably the first one that I encountered during my graduate school. And it is actually the one that uh, sparked my interest in working with tonal languages. So thank you about that. Lisa's 2013 textbook, The Sounds of Language, an introduction to phonetics and phonology has been used at ICU and a generation of students have been introduced to the area of linguistics through her textbook. So thank you for that as well. And it's good to have you here today. Today, Lisa will talk about towards, uh, uh, towards an articulative phonology for tone, evidence from Igbo vowel assimilation. Thank you so much for those kind words. Um, it is really my pleasure to be able to join you today. So let me see if I can manage um, to share my screen. Okay. All right, is that, uh, is that working? Yes, it's a full screen mode, yeah. Okay, and hopefully I remembered to check the box. Let me make sure to share the sound. Okay, so thank you again for the invitation and i do want to talk about towards an articulatory phonology for tone evidence for from ibo vowel assimilation so there has been a lot of acoustic work that's been done on tone timing discussing the ways that tones associate to syllables moras segments or prosodic boundaries the goal of this talk is to relate this work to articulatory phonology, um, work by originally by Broman and Goldstein and um, following on with work by Goldstein and colleagues. Um, in articulatory phonology, units such as syllables, moras, segments, and prosodic boundaries don't exist as primitives, and within articulatory phonology, very little work on tone has been done. So what I want to do in the next 35 minutes or so um, is to begin the talk by focusing on the syllable versus the mora as the tone bearing unit. So I want to uh, quickly review some data from Thai um, that I have uh, done with Ratiman Natisarot as well as Bruce Moran, and also some data from Serbian, which is work that I've done with Dragazets. After we've kind of established why it's important to distinguish syllables versus mores as tone-bearing units. Um, we want to review quickly how prosody and gestural timing work in articulatory phonology. Uh, basically, what is a syllable then, according to articulatory phonology? With that background in mind, uh, we can then turn to the EBO data, starting with work that I had done um, for my dissertation that was eventually published in 1997, talk about that background to set the stage for some new data on tones and vowels, and then um, conclude with some conjectures on how tonal timing in articulatory phonology might be related to uh, syllabic structure and moraic structure. So why is the TBU important? Begin with a look at the phonological importance of the mora versus the syllable. 
in Thai and in Serbian. I don't pick these languages randomly or just uh, random languages that I've worked on previously, but both of these languages have been investigated from an articulatory perspective by Robin Carlin, um, a series of articles and her dissertation. So Carlin used uh, electromagnetic articulography together with acoustic analysis to investigate timing of tones to articulatory gestures in Thai and in Serbian. So I'm going to circle back to Robin's work at the end of the talk. Okay, so let's start with Thai. As you know, there is a five-way tonal contrast in Thai, mid, high, low, falling, and rising, which seems completely tailor-made for representations as the syllable as the tone-bearing unit um, to which high and low auto segments associate. Um, for our purposes, we want to concentrate on the uh, contrast between high tones and falling tones and look at their realization in both citation and connected speech. So um, the interesting point for us here is that in connected speech, so-called falling tones don't fall. Of course, falling is the term that linguists give the tones. That's not the way that Thai speakers themselves refer to the tones. So here is the five-way tone contrast in citation forms on the left and in connected speech on the right. Looking first at the high tone, we see that the high tone stays in the middle of the pitch range in the first half of the syllable and then rises towards the end. And that shape is pretty much the same in citation form and in connected speech. When we compare that to the falling tone, we see that in citation form, you reach a very high point uh, about halfway through the syllable. In citation form, we then get the steep fall. But in connected speech, we again rise quickly to a very high point in the middle of the syllable and then do not fall. So what is this about? Um, here's an example of uh, what this sounds like. So this is a sentence, um, Brother Nart sit near Nim. And each of these words has a lexical uh, falling tone, which if you uh, say the word in isolation, you can see the clear fall. But when you put them together in a sentence, you get a slight fall at the phrase break, a big fall at, at the end, but otherwise just this high plateau. So this is what this sounds like. Hopefully you can hear it. P nat nang kai nim. P nat nang kai kai nim. Okay, so just hear this high plateau instead of falling tones. So it looks as though essentially the fall of the falling tone has been eliminated. So in connected speech then, if we get rid of the fall of the falling tone, um, the problem is that then we have collapsed and destroyed the contrast between the high and falling tones. But our... Um, Perceptual data show that um, falling and high are not at all confusable. Even in connected speech, falling tones are identified with 96% accuracy and are seldom, if ever, uh, confused with high tones. So even in connected speech, just this um, high value, high pitch value in the center of the syllable really makes the falling tones pop out. Uh, the most confusable tones actually are rising and low, High and mid are also fairly confusable, but falling tones are not confusable. So what's going on with the representation? Uh, the argument that first uh, Bruce Moran and I made and that um, again, uh, Ratima and I made is that this can be explained if we assume that the mora, not the syllable, is the tone bearing unit in Thai. So a high tone is a high auto segment associated to the second mora. So you get this shape of um, rising at the end of the syllable. Falling tones have a high on the first mora and in citation form, a low on the second mora. But then in non-phrase final position, you can delete the low and you still have a contrast between high and falling. It's simply a contrast in tone timing. High has a high tone at the second mora and falling has a high tone on the first mora. So that's Thai, um, where one has to assume that the mora is the tone bearing unit. Let's look at another example of the importance of the syllable versus the mora 
um, in tone timing. This is work with Dragazets where we have looked at dialectal variation in Serbian pitch accents. So we now have data from four cities, Novi Sad, Belgrade, Valjevo, and uh, Chachak, moving from north to south. Serbian is a wonderful language for super segmentals. It has contrastive vowel length, stress that is realized by increased vowel duration, intonation, here we'll look at a low boundary tone that occurs in statements, and also tone. Now, you may have heard that Serbian or Serbo-Croatian is traditionally characterized as a pitch accent system with rising and falling melodies associated to stressed syllables. However, Draga and I argue that this is actually based at, at heart a tone contrast. So for example, on three syllable words, there are three possible tone patterns, um, which, we, which are illustrated here and which we analyze straightforwardly as being a high associated to the first syllable, a high associated to the second, and a high associated to the third. So this is what these sound like, high on the first syllable, Novine. high on the second syllable, Marame. and high on the third syllable. Ramena. Okay, um, these, this type of shape is called a falling accent and clearly the pitch falls over most of the word. These two shapes are called rising accents where um, the pitch does rise over most of the word. Um, however, we simply take this as a simple tone contrast. And then um, the stressed syllable in these words occurs directly uh, before the high tone. So you can see the difference in length in the stressed syllable and unstressed syllable, stressed syllable and unstressed syllable. So that's our basic analysis of Serbian as a European tone language. What I want to talk about today is a possible conflict with intonation. So when the tone happens to, if we pick one of these words where the tone is associated to the word final syllable, there's a potential conflict with the intonational uh, boundary tone. So in words like Romana, Juvelir, um, and also Jovan and Volan, um, you have this high tone on the final syllable. What happens if you also need to associate a low boundary tone to that final syllable? Well, there's a conflict. Can we actually get two tones on that same syllable? Uh, the resolution of this possible conflict depends on the dialect and the length of the vowel. So as I had mentioned in these words, the stressed syllable is always going to precede the lexically high toned syllable. And in some cases, depending on um, the dialect and the length of the final vowel, as we'll see, that high tone retracts or moves left onto the stressed syllable. So let's look at some data. Um, we have six female speakers now from each town. Um, reading these words in both phrase initial and phrase final position. The measurement that we're going to look at is peak location relative to the stressed syllable. So where does that high peak actually occur? Is it in the stressed syllable or is it in the syllable afterwards? Um, the lexical position is post-tonic. If the peak does retract to the stressed syllable, uh, does it retract and under what conditions? Okay. So um, I'm going to show you a couple of these graphs. This one um, shows the case of words with this H lexically associated to the final, final syllable. If the final syllable is short, but now we're looking at phrase initial position where we do not expect any interaction with the low tone. Um, the graph is showing um, the location of the peak the shaded area is the stressed syllable. So if a dot or a data point is occurring in the shaded area, it's occurring on the stressed syllable. If it's occurring afterwards, it's occurring on the post tonic, which again is where its lexical position is. So in these phrase initial position where we are not expecting any interaction with the low tone, um, 
we see for three of the dialects, Novi Sad, Belgrade, and Valjevo, there is no movement. The tone is occurring where we would expect it to, based on its lexical position. Um, in Chachak, we do get retraction. So as we'll see, Chachak is always having um, the tone move backwards. Okay. What happens now if we go move to phrase final position? As you can see, if you compare this graph to this graph, we see that for both Belgrade and Valjevo, the high tone moves left and is now occurring on the stressed syllable. What about, this is if the final syllable is short, what about if the final syllable is long? Certainly for Belgrade, there is no retraction. For Valjevo, it looks like it's patterning with Belgrade and also um, not moving. But if we look a little closer at the pitch shapes, we see an important difference. So in Belgrade, again, this is with a long final vowel, the stress syllable is low and you get the high in that lexical final spot. What's happening in Valjevo is that the stress syllable is actually high. You get this long plateau. The fall is occurring in the final syllable but that stress syllable is still high, and so we count this as an instance of retraction. So um, the conclusion is that the resolution of, the lex of this conflict between the lexical high and the uh, low boundary tone depends on the dialect. In Novi Sad, there is never any retraction. The lexical tone always wins. In fact, the low boundary tone is deleted uh, so in these dialects, you have this rise at the end of many words that you don't get in the, um, in the other dialects. And the way to make fun of somebody from Novi Sad is to uh, make fun of them for their rising intonation, for their uptalk, if you like. Uh, Chachak is the opposite. You get consistent retraction in all contexts. So those two dialects are less interesting for, from our point of view today. Um, what I'd like to draw your attention to is the contrast between Belgrade and Valjevo. So both Belgrade and Valjevo do show retraction as an interaction with this low tone. In Belgrade, you get retraction from short vowels only. In Valjevo, you get retraction from both long and short vowels. We would argue that this difference is due to the fact that in Belgrade, the mora is the TBU, whereas in Valjevo, the syllable is the TBU. This is shown here. Um, so um, here are words with a short vowel in phrase medial position versus phrase final position. Um, in Belgrade, the more is the TBU. In Valjevo, the syllable is the TBU. Um, in medial position, there is no problem. The H can stay on the final mora or the final syllable. Uh, if we need to associate the low boundary tone to that final mora, if the vowel is short, the H has to move. There's only one mora, it can't be shared. But if the vowel is long, there is room for both in Belgrade. In Valjevo, where the TBU is the syllable, only one tone per syllable, whether the vowel is long or short, that H tone has to move. Okay, so why the detours to Asia and Europe when this talk is supposed to be about Igbo? The point is to uh, bring home the point that distinguishing between the mora and the syllable as the tone bearing unit is important for tonal phonology and for tone timing. So, um, how can articulatory phonology, for which uh, the mora and the syllable are not basic units, how can articulatory phonology address this important distinction? So um, a brief excursus into timing in articulatory phonology, which will probably be review for most of you. So in articulatory phonology, the basic units are articulatory gestures, not features or segments. And as I said, prosodic structures such as syllables and phrases are not primitives, but arise out of stable patterns of gestural coordination. So can we find some gestural approach that's consistent with the acoustic findings? What are the stable patterns of coordination? And do they correspond with the prosodic structure that acoustic investigations have found? 
Another way of putting this is what is the articulatory tone bearing unit? So um, one way of looking at gestural timing is to draw out a gestural score as shown here for the English utterance pan. Um, in a gestural score, um, the independently movable articulators are listed on the left, time is on the x-axis, and each uh, rectangle corresponds to an interval during which a particular gesture is active. So for the P, we have a bilabial closure gesture associated to laryngeal opening. Then we have a tongue body gesture for the A, ah, and for the N, an alveolar closure gesture associated to velum opening. Each of these arrows indicates a specified timing relationship. So the P and the vowel actually begin at the same time, but the laryngeal opening is timed to extend a little bit beyond the uh, bilabial closure, resulting in aspiration. Um, the N occurs at the end of the vowel, but the velum opening occurs somewhat earlier, resulting in nasalization on the vowel. Okay, um, things get a little bit more complicated if we look at um, onset clusters where we see a phenomenon of C center timing, which becomes important for describing what's going on with tone. So these are gestural scores for the words span and plan based on scores from uh, Broman and Goldstein 1988. These are exactly the same as pan, except I've added another gesture here for the S and here for the L. What's important to realize for these um, onset clusters is that the vowel and laryngeal gestures are actually timed to the midpoint of the cluster, that is the C center, resulting in the consonant timing being somewhat offset. Um, the first gesture gets nudged a little bit to the left, the second gesture gets nudged a little bit to the right relative to the vowel. Um, these different timing patterns give different allophonic realizations such that now the laryngeal gesture is over by the time the bilabial closure is released resulting in an unaspirated P. Or here the L extends um, into the laryngeal opening for the P giving us a devoiced L. So this C center timing where the consonants are nudged a little bit apart um, as you enter into these clusters is argued to actually be diagnostic for syllable affiliation. So if you see this relation, this timing relationship between the gestures, you can argue that they are part of a syllable. Now that's a lot of arrows, a lot of different timing relationships, uh, which can really overgenerate possible timing relations and possible contrasts. So is it possible for gestural timing to be more constrained? Yes, as argued, for example, in Goldstein et al. 2009 and subsequent work, if we think of gestures as oscillators that can couple with each other, uh, then only two basic timing relations can be represented, either in phase, uh, which indicates two gestures that are simultaneous, and this is indicated in a coupling graph by a solid line. So here, the first consonant and the vowel begin simultaneously, as was shown here. Uh, the second type of relationship is antiphase, or precedence, and this is shown by a dotted line. And this is argued to be what's happening with coda consonants. So here, the alveolar closure gesture begins as the vowel gesture ends. This is argued to be a cross-linguistic pattern of syllable structure uh, where you get this linear precedence or antiphase in the coda, but simultaneity or in phase in the onset. What then about the C-center timing? Uh, more complicated timing patterns can be captured by talking about competing couplings. So how do we get the C-center timing? The co competition here is that onset consonants want to be both sequential to each other, as indicated by the dashed line, but they both want to be simultaneous with the vowel. So they want to be sequential, 
they want to be simultaneous. The competition is resolved by having them just slightly offset, and this creates the C center effect. Let's get to tone. What about tone? How is that timed? Well, some initial studies in uh, Mandarin find that the tone acts like a consonant in the onset, participating in this C center relationship with other onset consonants. So the relationship of the tone to the vowel is influenced by what the consonants are in the onset and the presence of the tone changes the relationship of the onset consonants to each other. Uh, so this relation of the C center timing was found for Mandarin, also for Valuvo Serbian, and for at least some tones in Thai by Carlin. So uh, Carlin illustrates the C center timing here for tones, just as the S and the P are timed to each other and to the vowel in a word like spa. Um, in a ma with a high tone, the M and the H are timed to each other and to the vowel. Uh, timing of tones to consonants has also been found for uh, Tibetan by Hu and by Geisler. So it's like, who knew? Tones are behaving like consonants. Uh, which means that we can now get to Igbo as a test case. So what I want to do with Igbo is to extend the typology to an African language. Previous work, um, my own previous work on Igbo has documented changes in tongue body gestures for vowel sequences. Um, now I want to ask what's going to happen with the tone when the vowel gestures change. So Igbo is a Niger-Congo language spoken in southern Nigeria. It has eight vowels, three surface tones, no complex onsets, and no codas. In a sequence of two vowels at a word boundary, the first assimilates to the second. So here, um, for example, edato, um, meaning three cocoa yams, an a a sequence um, is described as assimilating to uh, become an a a sequence. There's been a lot of discussion in the literature as to whether this assimilation is complete or gradient. Uh, Clark argued that the assimilation was complete in vowel quality, but with no change in tone. Amenanjo argued that yes, assimilation was complete, but only if the tone was shared. Um, Wellmers argued for partial and gradient assimilation of both vowel quality and tone. Um, and in my own work, I argued for variable reduction of V1, but no change in tone. So um, let me uh, review the previous experiment from 1993 or 97. Um, three speakers of Igbo, six repetitions of 28 noun phrases where vowels come together at a word boundary. I took measurements of the formants and of duration. And what I found was that F1 and F2 do indeed show variable reduction or assimilation, um, but that greater assimilation was not correlated with shorter duration. So here's an example of this AA sequence for the phrase three cocoa yams. And I measured um, F2 at the onset of the vowel, 25 milliseconds into the vowel, and where the vowel target was reached. In this graph, the um, triangles represent F2 values for A in isolation, so up here around 2000 Hertz. The squares are F2 values for A in isolation around 1500 Hertz. And what we see in an A uh, sequence is that at the beginning of the vowel, uh, the values are actually going to be variable and in between what's expected for an A and what's expected for an A. So this is what this sounds like. So you can hear there's something that though, there's something happening after that D, um, but you're not really getting a full um, A type vowel. So in that work, I gave an articulatory phonology um, analysis of what was going on here. So here's an unassimilated sequence um, where the first vowel and tone um, are unchanged and equal to the second vowel with its tone. Um, in an assimilated sequence, V1 shortens and V2 lengthens. 
but I need something to maintain the consistent timing. And so my argument back then was that, well, it must be the tone. If we keep these tone gestures unchanged, then uh, we can keep the uh, consonants the right amount apart and can account for this consistent timing. However, uh, back in 1997, this was just a conjecture. I did not actually measure the F0. So we need to go back and do this right. So uh, measure F0 and F2 and duration. And um, find out what's happening with the tone. Is F0 stable across the segmental variation as proposed by Clark and by my own work? If that's the case, we would expect to see this um, F0 timing um, remain stable with a change from the first tone to the second tone occurring pretty much halfway through the vowel sequence, despite whatever changes in um, F2 might be going on. Or um, conversely, do formant and pitch vary together, then uh, the prediction would be that as the vowel gets shorter, then the F0 target will also um, move with it. Then once we see what the answer is, we can ask what does the result tell us about models of tonal timing? So um, I'm going to revisit a subset of the data from my previous work, as well as some new sentences from a previously recorded but not digitized corpus. These were the same three participants, but a whole new set of phrases with um, many more uh, variations in tone. So um, again, going back to uh, using this old data um, because plans for new data, data collection uh, couldn't take place this year. So I went back to these old phrases and I selected ones where uh, the tones were going to be different, where I could see change in F0, either high to low or low to high. And similarly, uh, where there would be a uh, large change in F2, so either a front vowel followed by a back vowel, a back vowel followed by a front vowel. Um, I needed adequate quality for both to be measured, no pauses between words, so I was able to find an additional uh, 138 tokens of 38 different phrases. So um, in the 1997 data, um, everything was carefully controlled for the consonant and the vowel environment, phrase structure, and for tone, it was always a high followed by a mid, a front vowel followed by a back. In this additional corpus data, there was more varied environments. So both front to back and back to front, high to low and low to high. So um, utterances segmented and analyzed in PROT. Um, the F0 target was measured as the end of the tone one steady state and the start of the transition to tone two. Um, the F2 target, the end of the V1, the vowel steady state and the start of the transition to V2. Again, the sequences were always chosen so that uh, T1 and T2 and V1 and V2 would be different. In some cases, if there was no transition, just a steady state, then uh, the target was marked at vowel onset. I did make these measurements in two separate passes uh, to try to be as independent as possible. First, I marked the tone, and then I turned the pitch off and went back and marked the vowels without looking at the pitch. Um, I also measured the overall duration of the vowel sequence, and then um, I want to measure the distance from the vowel onset to F0, to that point where F0 changes, and the distance from vowel onset to that point where F2 changes, and were those correlated. The result, and this is basically the, the point of the talk right here, F0 and F2 vary together, contra what I had predicted back in 1997. So here, for example, is an e ah sequence, and you can see as the F2 begins to change and move from E to A, ah, that's right at the point where the tone begins to change. Here's a case with more, assimilate, with more assimilation where you have an A, and just at this point where the um, A transitions to A, ah, you can also see that the tone is transitioning at exactly that same point. Here's the correlation. 
Um, if we look at all of the data, um, here is the distance from vowel onset to F0 target. Here is the distance from vowel onset to F2 target. Over all of this data, the correlation is uh, clear, um, pretty good at 0.637. Uh, there are a couple of uh, seeming outliers over here where the F0 target is rather late, um, but there is still a vowel steady state. Um, there is no uh, change, it looks like complete assimilation. I went back and looked at those and found that these tokens were all of um, fixed phrases, meaning another one, this one, or the word for a villa or country house. Um, so I would argue that these have been lexicalized. So let's get rid of them. Um, we get rid of those. That increases the um, correlation a little bit. Um, if we just look at the um, 1997 data only where the consonant, the vowel, and the tone sequence were very carefully controlled, um, the correlation goes way up to 0.859, which is about the highest correlation I've gotten in any work I've done in 30 years. So good, that's a really good correlation. Is it possible that this really high correlation is due to um, some third factor, maybe just as the sequence gets longer, both F0 and F2 move together? Um, so I also did a correlation between F0 and duration, and that correlation is much worse. It is true that the, both the targets get later as um, the vowel sequence gets longer, but the correlation is not that great. And if you look at the carefully controlled data, it only gets worse. So um, how can we account for this? The model proposed um, by me in uh, my earlier work accounts for the formant trajectories, but is not consistent with the F0 variation. The tones are not constant. So I propose a new uh, timing model following Marin and Goldstein 2012 on Romanian vowel sequences, um, where if V1 and V2 are in an antiphase coupling, there's no overlap and no assimilation. But crucially, the vowels and the tones are timed only to each other, not to the consonants. So how do we make assimilation happen? Well, my proposal here is that we can change the timing of V2 so that V2 is also um, simultaneous with V1, creating a competing coupling where V1 and V2 um, want to be both sequential and both simultaneous with the first consonant, creating this overlap and therefore assimilation. Um, variation in the degree of assimilation can be modeled as varying strengths. Um, as V1 becomes weaker, V2 is going to dominate. But crucially, what we see with the way that the um, tones and vowels are moving together is that the tones are timed only to the vowels. And the, um, there is no variation in the consonants. Okay, so I was wrong in 1997. I hope I've got things uh, better now. But what does this mean for general models of tone timing? So tones and vowels are co-selected. This is against the findings for Mandarin and other language languages. Ebo tones are not associated to the consonants. So is this variation a problem or is it a possible solution? What's the prosodic target, prosodic unit targeted for reduction in Ebo? What sort of unit affects vowels and tones but not consonants? Could we be talking about a more sized unit? So here I will get, um, <laughs> I will uh, go out on a limb a little bit. If C center timing is diagnostic of syllable structure, as was argued by Shaw and colleagues in 2009, then maybe for these languages where we see the C center effect for tone, Mandarin, Tibetan, and Valuvo Serbian, um, this could be the in 
uh, diagnostic of the syllable as the tone bearing unit. Whereas in the languages where we don't find a C center effect for tone, in Igbo, as in Carlin found in Belgrade Serbian, um, this might be diagnostic of the mora as the tone bearing unit. So um, work by Carlin independently found a C center effect for Valjevo, but not for Belgrade. And this um, could go along with what we find about the syllable versus the mora being the tone bearing unit in those languages. What about Thai? Uh, more research into complex tones is needed. Uh, Carlin examined falling tones and suggested that the H was timed to the onset and the L to the vowel, which is consistent with the tone simplification facts we discussed earlier, um, but uh, it's a complex system, needs more work. To fill out the timing, it's possible. Um, is there antiphase timing for tone? Well, maybe that's what boundary tones are. That's why they occur at the edges, because maybe they are in antiphase timing. So, so far, the number of languages that have been studied, to my knowledge, is uh, five. So um, anything has to be, any um, kind of typological generalization has to be quite uh, conjecture. Um, I do plan additional data on Igbo. I'm looking forward to additional data collection on vowel sequences in Igbana uh, from one of our students. Um, certainly more diverse tone studies are needed, but this will be a definite direction for research in my next 30 years. Thank you. And I will stop sharing. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> Great. And we will all look forward to your next 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll finally get it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, great. Uh, so the first question comes from Shigeto Kawahara at Takeo University. Lisa, this is great. I, I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Shigeto. So I, have, I have two questions, one general and one specific. So I'll just start with the general one and see if other people have question. So since you declared that this is going to be your research agenda for the next 30 years, <laughs> I wanted to ask, I've been thinking a lot about this um, relationship between sublaryngeal gesture and the laryngeal gesture, which you've talked about. And one forgotten principle in the literature is articulatory binding uh, proposed by Kingston, right? And it seems like what you're finding is that really the supralaryngeal gesture and the laryngeal gestures are coordinated with each other, right? So, mm -hmm. and uh, Kingston has this, has something to say about it too, that laryngeal gesture is often bound to the, the release phase of consonants. And uh, Jason Shaw and I are looking at um, uh, the high vowel devoicing in Japanese, where it seems like um, when uh, two voices consonants are so close to each other, it results in one big laryngeal abduction gesture, which kind of influences the reorganization of the uh, super laryngeal gesture. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm throwing out a lot of uh, recent <laughs> right. thoughts on about this, but if you have thoughts about like the generality, gen generality of this um, super laryngeal laryngeal gesture coordination, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Sorry if it's too general. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's definitely where we need more data, right? Because, um, so for example, in Igbo, right, we just don't have a lot of laryngeal contrasts. And so um, it's hard to answer that data with respect to, um, to Igbo. In Thai, um, what we find, and um, this goes back to house, right? Where um, kind of the first half of the syllable is, um, due to the um, is dedicated to the, sorry my cat is here can she say hi she just knocked the can they say hi <laughs> the zoo the the uh, um I advantage did. of zoom is that we get to see one another's cats sorry she just knocked my um phone off i didn't do that to um avoid the question so right in thai what we find is that the uh, laryngeal gesture for the consonant and the tone um, get pushed apart. So you do you do the um, consonant contrast first in the first half of the syllable, and then you pay attention to the second half. 
So um, I think we really don't understand this relationship between the laryngeal gestures for consonants and the laryngeal gestures for tone. Um, yeah, so I had really been thinking and uh, this, you know, the previous studies like Carlin's work and Gao's work looked at the consonant gesture, the oral gesture, but maybe what we should be looking at is the laryngeal gesture and the, right? And this is that those guys are going to be timed, but right, you don't always have that laryngeal gesture. So yeah, I think, I think we need to look more at Thai and we need to, you know, we've got to go do these uh, Central American languages that have all this going on with laryngeal gestures and, and tone. So yeah, it's going to take us 30 years to, to figure it out. But, yeah, but thank you for the, uh, for the comment about we have to remember that the larynx is doing a lot of different things. Oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Uh, if uh, anyone else have question, please send me your name and affiliation. Uh, I have a quick question, like uh, in your data set, um, I think uh, your 97 data had uh, the Z sound in front of these mm -hmm. vowel uh, contexts and the new corpus data had voiceless consonants or an R sound. And I was just wondering um, if that context was a nasal, how this uh, timing would happen because when I look at some language, tonal languages with the nasal onset, it seems like uh, in this, the nasal component, you already see uh, some kind of F0 uh, mm. uh, excursion playing a role. Uh, or in one language that I work with Shigeto and uh, others, uh, we found a tonal contrast that's uh, mostly appearing in the nasal component. Mm. Uh, for, but it gets neutralized in the vowel, whereas uh, in obstruents, you don't have that luxury <laughs> of having the Right, name. right. Uh, so the contrast uh, really begins in the vowel component. So I was wondering how Igbo will... Uh, what, I, didn't see, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't see anything that dramatic, but mm -hmm. I do think that um, some of these differences in onsets is contributing to the fact that I got a worse correlation um, mm -hmm. when I looked at the broader data set and a better correlation when I looked at the narrower data set. Um, I think there are differences um, in high to low versus low to high, so I'd like to break them out um, that way. I'd also like to break them out by onset. Um, I didn't notice anything particularly different about the nasal onsets versus the obstruent onsets, and I really don't at this point have enough data to do a lot of breaking them out. Um, it's hard to know. Um, yeah, this second data set that I was working at, working with was just not that well controlled to look at all of these mm -hmm. differences. And so, right, as we go forwards and are able to collect new data, I will definitely be doing some better control of the different kinds of onsets and the different kinds of tone sequences so that I can look more carefully at that, um, that kind of question. Yep. Unfortunately, Ebo doesn't really do consonant clusters, but I do want to add some of the uh, labiovelars, mm. right? Because labiovelars should be showing the C center effect. So we right. should be seeing, well, if we have a lack of a C center effect, we should be seeing that uh, the labiovelars and the simple velars behave exactly the same. So that's a pretty clear prediction. Um, and I just didn't have the data now to uh, be able to test that, but. Um, that is something I will definitely be looking at when I'm able to collect the more controlled data. Thank you. And uh, Shigeto has another question. Can we go back to your um, uh, the slide where you show the proposal about the timing gesture? Sure. Yeah. So. Oops, I'm going to try to go back. You're proposing that both vowels are coordinated with the preceding consonant, right? Oh, let me go back. So yeah, that yeah. one, right. Mm -hmm. So I guess I have two questions. One is that, is there any sense in which that C1, V1, V2 are in the same syllable that this, this, this diagram some, um, yeah. right? Would make sense if that's the case. That's one question and also, this seems to predict that you would um, observe 
V center effect between Vn and V2, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to know. It's really hard to know because unlike, um, so I don't have articulatory data. Mm -hmm. And so I can't really see exactly what the, what the tongue body is doing, but yeah, I think, I think yes, that you would, right? So you're getting this blending in the first half. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure that I still, that I have this uh, quite right yet. Um, we might need to do something more to, um, you know, maybe have this idea of repeating gestures. So I think Caitlin Smith at Hopkins oh, yeah, has yeah, yeah, work yeah. with that, you know, that you have to have a, basically a, a gesture that says repeat the gesture that you just did. Uh, so I think that that might be something that uh, could be added in to get this um, lengthening of of the V2 gesture to kind of push that into the second syllable. But I do think, yeah, in this, I mean, I don't know, right? I don't know what that, um, let me go all the way back and just play that one sequence. Whoops, here it is. Right? Um, oops. Come on. So yeah, um, what is that? I mean, is that three syllables? Is that four syllables? I'm, I'm not sure. Huh. So I didn't ask my, I didn't ask the speakers if, if what the syllable count was, um, but that would definitely be something that would be worth asking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I guess V V center, if there's such a thing, is really hard to pin down because I guess vocalic gestures are so more prone to blending. Right. And there you can't like um you know, if you're gonna do a, the C center, you do the P and the L and you can right, see yeah, 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 the yeah. P and the L are doing definitely doing different things. But the C center is always gonna be the tongue body. And so even under the best of circumstances, I'm not sure you can tell where, yeah, where one thing. starts and, and the other end. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to um, totally swear by that gestural score. I, I think that needs more work. But I do think something like that is going on where you're getting that timing of the second vowel is encroaching into the space of the first. OK, great. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, uh, we can uh, move on to uh, the uh, breakout rooms, uh, but uh, uh, let's thank Lisa one more time. Uh, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> thank you. And let's stop the recording for now.